The songs about the blood that our choir sang about and songs about the cross that we just heard about are that is the essence of Christianity. I'm thankful for those who have such wonderful talents and sing, but not only do they sing, they sing the right message. The story was told that um, London writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was quite a trickster. He was going to play a trick on some of his friends, 12 of them, and so he sent all 12 of them this message. Your secret has been found out. Flee at once. It is reported that all 12 of them within 24 hours had left the country. Well, I wonder what you would have done. I wonder what I would have done. Guilt makes us do terrible things. Guilt makes cowards out of all of us. Guilt has the ability to paralyze our lives. But you don't have to live with guilt. You can be set free from the paralyzing, powerful grip of guilt. Would you be interested in knowing how you can do that? I want you to look with me this morning in Psalm 32. The 32nd Psalm, and by the way, this is a penitential psalm. That is, it is a psalm where David confesses his sin to God. A companion psalm would be Psalm 51, where David acknowledges his sin, confesses his sin, and receives God's forgiveness. Let's stand together and honor the reading of God's Word. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto thee. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass, about, compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near, come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be in the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Father, we pray that you will be pleased to use the message today. Open our hearts and give us ears with which to hear your message. We pray for those who are in need of salvation today. Lord, may this be the hour when they acknowledge their need of Christ and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. And Father, help us as your people to be sensitive to sin and the life so that we might be cleansed by the blood of Christ in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. I'm speaking today on the blessedness of forgiveness. By the way, it is a blessing that we can be forgiven of our sin, isn't it? You don't have to live under the weight of sin and you don't have to have the misery of unconfessed sin in the life. You can be set free from the burden and the guilt of sin. Now I want to say this. You can be guilty and not feel guilty. You cannot be guilty and feel guilty. The fact of the matter is that guilt is more than a feeling. Guilt is a fact. When Paul was establishing the universality of sin and the human race in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, he said that all of the world is guilty before God. What that means is the best person you've ever known and, and the greatest preacher you've ever heard and the godliest wife you've ever seen. All of us are guilty before God. 
And then in the book of James, James continued to talk about that we are guilty before God. And he said, for whosoever shall keep the law and stumble yet in one point is guilty of all. I'm here to announce to you today that God does not grade on the curve. You don't, you don't smoke, you don't chew, you don't go with the girls who do, but you are still guilty before God. If you don't meet all of the requirements of God, all of the standards of God, all of the commandments of God, the Bible says that you are guilty of all. I am, you are. Because today, I started to say this last week, but I think I'll narrow it down to today. All of us today have violated one of the commandments of God. I know how we like to protest and we like to alibi and justify and we like to point out how we're not like other sinners. Well, I want to remind you that that the Bible says that there are sins of of commission. That is, sins that we commit. We, We do things that are contrary to the Word of God. That constitutes sin. We commit a sin. We do a thing. We step over the line of God. And the Bible says that is sin. But I want to remind you this morning, whenever it is, I want to remind you this morning that not only are there sins of commission, there are sins of omission. That is, there are things we should have done, we're commanded to do, but for whatever reason, we just don't do them. Did you witness this past week? Do you tithe? Are you faithful in the Lord's service? So not only are you guilty because of what you do, you can also be guilty because of what you don't do. And then the Bible talks about those mental attitude sins. And I would suggest to you this morning that this is what trips up more Christians than anything else. No, you're not going to find them in an alley uh, drunk. You're not going to find them doing immoral things they shouldn't do. But they have in their mind mental attitude sins. Let me give you just a sampling of what might be a mental attitude sin. It could be hatred. It could be the spirit of unforgiveness. It could be malice. It could be jealousy. And so don't stand there, sit there and say this morning, well, you know what? I'm not, I've never been arrested. I've never engaged in immoral activity. But what about the sins of omission? What about the sins of the mind? Y'all, we're all guilty. And then the Bible speaks about the sins of the tongue. We say things we shouldn't say. Of course, my response to that is, well, you ought to be thankful for the things I wanted to say but didn't. Uh, But but we're all guilty of sins of the tongue. What I'm saying to you this morning is that we are all guilty. and, And I hear the argument, but I'm a Christian. Well, you know, being a Christian does not keep you from sin. You say, well, I'm going to heaven when I die. But you're still guilty of sin now. Uh, one of the biggest surprises that I had, when, and I was saved young, but, but one of the biggest surprises that I had after I was saved is that I still had the ability to sin. And I'll go a step further and say not only did I have the ability to sin, very often I had the desire to sin. Sin is a problem. And sin brings guilt. So what do we do with our guilt? We need to do what David did. The first thing that he tells us is that sin in the life of a believer is like a burden. You see, being saved doesn't mean you cannot sin. But I'll tell you this, as as David gives us in this psalm an an, an x-ray of a guilty conscience, David makes it abundantly clear that if you are saved, you've been born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, that while you may sin, you cannot sin and be happy in your sin. Notice how David described it. Look what he says in verse number 3, in Psalm 32, verse 3, When I kept silence... Maybe you want to underline that word silence. When I kept silence. Someone as well said that to err is human and somebody followed it up and said and to try to cover it up is human too. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? We've perfected the art of covering up our sin. We, we, we cover it up. We, we don't want to acknowledge and we cover it up by making excuses and we cover it up by, by pointing out the faults of someone else. 
We covered up by saying, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Uh, or or I'm, like, I'm like my dad's side of the family. And, and we try to cover up our sin. You see, not only was the problem of sin uh, in David's life, but there was another problem, and that was the problem of silence. Sweeping it under the rug as though it is no big deal. Acting like everybody else does it. Acting like, well, you know, it was just a minor infraction. Listen to me this morning. In light of the holiness of God, there is no such thing as a small sin. Now the way we look at each other, we might categorize them, but y'all, we're not God. In the light of how great God is, how holy God is, there's no such thing as a small sin or as a, a sin that's not as, as dangerous as another. No, no, no. D- David said, when I kept silence, what happened to him when he kept silent? Well, well, notice what he says in verse 3. He said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. Uh, David is speaking poetically here. My bones waxed old. He's talking about pain. He's talking about misery in the life. If you can sin day after day persistently and there's no conviction in your heart, there's no desire to turn away from your sin, you need to accept Christ as your Savior. A child of God does not persist without this conviction, without this pain. And and David says, this is what is going on in my heart. My sin is, in Psalm 51, he said, my sin is ever before me. And in Psalm 51, David talks uh, poetically about the pain that is in his life. Now there are others who say that instead of speaking poetically, David was speaking literally. That is, sin was making an old man out of him. Sin, his bones were waxing old. Now I want you to listen to me very carefully and don't don't read into what I'm saying. There is such a thing as psychosomatic illnesses. Suke is the Greek word for soul. Soma is the word for body. You put them together and it is soul and body. The soul can get so sick because of unconfessed sin that it makes the body sick. Now listen to this. Not all sickness is due to some act of sin. But sometimes it may be. It might manifest itself as a migraine headache. It might manifest itself as... uh, um, Uh, being irritable all of the time. It might manifest itself as blood pressure. And by the way, I've got that. Thank you. (laughs) Sometimes I say way too much. (laughs) But if you have a sin in your life, you keep pushing it down and pushing it down, covering it up, sweeping it under the rug. Sooner or later, as a child of God, that that will make your body sick. David said, my bones are waxing old within me. But now look what he says in verse number 4. For day and night thy hand are heavy upon me. He says, God, your hand is heavy on me. Listen to me this morning. What, what, a, what a terminology. This is an anthropomorphic statement about God. The hand of God is upon me. When you look through the Bible at the hand of God, the hand of God would lead. The hand of God would guide. The hand of God would protect. But here he says, the hand of God is upon me because of my sin. You know how it feels when you're out of fellowship with God and the hand of God is bearing down on you? There's pressure. There's pain. You feel like nothing works and nothing is turning out right and there's just something not right. That is God's hand on you. You see, you belong to Him. You're His child. He doesn't want you to live that way. And so the hand of God, God applies pressure to your life to cause you to see the sin that is there to lead you to repentance. And David said, the hand of God was upon me. But now look at verse number 4. He said, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. David's now speaking about the dryness in his soul. You ever, you ever had a part soul? And, and you know the, the ironic thing about that? Sin is the only thing I know that will bring dryness to a heart. Spiritually dry. 
Some today perhaps could describe their spiritual life as, as living in a spiritual drought. There's no life there. There's no, there's no growth there. There's no vegetation there. There's no freshness there. Their, their soul is best described as, as a, a drought. It's, uh, we need a fresh rain. And the only way to get it is through repentance and trust in God. David said, my soul is experiencing a drought now I want to tell you, our souls can experience at least two kinds of wounds. One of them is a clean wound and one of them is a dirty wound. Listen to this. A clean wound is sorrow. And our hearts break when a loved one is taken, when tragic events happen in our life, and sorrow fills our hearts. It's sad. But how many of you know today that God heals broken hearts? God can heal your sorrow. I hate that statement. Well, it'll be okay in time. Time heals all wounds. Time doesn't do anything. God does it. And that, that is a wound. But it's a clean wound. And God will heal it. But I'm going to tell you, there's, an, there's, a, there's another kind of wound that we experience in life, in our hearts. That is a dirty wound. And the dirty wound is sin. And you can come to church more, you can tithe more, you can give more, you can be more faithful, you can do everything you want to do. But guess what happens to that dirty wound? It just continues to fester and it continues to put poison into your soul and into your heart. This dirty wound cannot be fixed by being more faithful. This dirty wound cannot be healed by, by giving more money. There's only one cure for the dirty wound that sin brings into our life, and that is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. What shall wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way to have a clean heart, and that is by the blood of Jesus Christ. So David said this, I, I tried to hide my sin. Tried to cover it up, tried to push it down, tried to sweep it under the rug. And David said, boy, was I miserable. So we move now from the burden of sin. And I want you to see a second thing David brings us in this psalm, and that is the beauty of forgiveness. There's the burden of sin on the wrong hand, on the one hand, but there's the beauty of forgiveness on the other. Look at it in verse 5. Boy, I hope I can contain myself. David said, I acknowledged my sin. Now, scholars believe that it was about a year from the time of his sin to the time that he confessed his sin. It is not that after David sinned with Bathsheba uh, and adultery and Uriah and murder, it is not that he immediately confessed his sin and received God's forgiveness. For a year, he had perhaps alibied. For a year, perhaps, he had uh, blamed it on someone else or, or said everybody else is doing it. And, and so for a year, David has carried around this burden of sin and now he says, I acknowledge my sin. Maybe that's what we need to do today. Maybe that is God's word to you today. You know what? You need to quit trying to deny it, explain it away, and alibi it. And today you just need to acknowledge your sin. Let me tell you how it came about in the life of David. There's David, he's trying to be a leader, he's trying to be the king, and, and he has this hidden sin in his heart, and, and he hasn't confessed it to God, and, and, and uh, God sent a prophet to him by the name of Nathan. Nathan, Nathan comes to David and he says, uh, I want to tell you a story. There was a little family, they were a tight-knit family, and they had one little lamb, and that lamb was a pet. They treated that one little lamb like a family member. The neighbor had a ranch of sheep, hundreds of sheep, but he wanted that one lamb, and he went and got it. And let me tell you how people respond when they got unconfessed sin in their life. David got judgmental. David, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You got unconfessed confessed sin in your life, it'll make you judgmental. And David got judgmental, and David got caustic, and David got hateful, and the old prophet of God flung his finger under the nose of the king and said, you are the man. With that, David's heart was broken. 
with that David turned from his sin. And, and here he says now in verse number 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin. Let me ask you this morning, what would it take for you in this service now to acknowledge your sin, to say, I have sinned against God. There's sin in my heart. It is unconfessed. It is like a cancer that is growing in my soul. It is a sore that is festering. What would it take to bring you tonight to, to say, my sin is ever before me and by the grace of God I acknowledge my sin I am guilty before God David said I acknowledge my sin but look what else he said he said my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid boy it's human nature to try to hide it isn't it we try to cover it up alibi it we try to excuse it and David said I haven't I haven't tried to hide it he said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord now listen to me, I'm, I'm trying to get done here. The way you get rid of the burden of guilt and the way you know the blessedness of having your sins forgiven is when you confess your sins to God. Now you can't confess your sin until first of all you acknowledge your sin. So you acknowledge your sin, which should lead to the second step, which is confessing your sin. I acknowledge my sin. I'm guilty before God. And now you confess your sin. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, some, some have the idea, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to be more faithful. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more involved in the church. Well, that doesn't cleanse you of your sin. You have to confess before you can ever be cleansed. And to confess is that we agree with God. We say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin we acknowledge our sin and we agree with God. That's what it means to confess our sins. Now I'm not going to, well I am going to ask you this. Have you ever tried to barter with God? And here's what I'm talking about. God, if you forgive me, I'll never do that again. Well, it don't work. You say, well, how do you know it doesn't work? Well, the Word of God teaches that it doesn't. And secondly, because I tried it. And you have too. God, if you forgive me, I'll, I'll never commit that sin again. You don't have to do that. You say, listen, you, you're making an empty promise to God. Your, con your forgiveness of sin is not contingent upon you making a vow, I'll never commit that sin again. That's not what confession is about. Confession is agreeing with God. You don't have to vow that you'll never do it again. You don't have to vow that you'll try to do better. You agree with God. Put your sin under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and there is forgiveness and cleansing. Amen. So David says... In, in verse 5, I, I, I will confess my sin unto the Lord. And look at this. He forgives the iniquity of my sin. I want to go now back to the first two verses of Psalm 32. He's acknowledged his sin. He's confessed his sin. He's talked about the burden of sin. But now he wants to tell us the blessedness of it. Look, look again at verse 1. He said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed it is the same word that is used in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man. It is a plural word. Uh, I don't know how to translate it. I don't know how to explain it. It's just a plural. And he, and he says the, uh, the manifold blessings of forgiven sin. Uh, it is the blessednesses of having sins forgiven. Uh, he's conveying the idea that there is joy, there is happiness when you acknowledge your sin and you say, I am guilty before God. I agree with God about my sin. I receive His forgiveness. He says, you'll be happy for that. Hasn't that been your experience? Has it not been your experience that when you come to grips with the reality of your sin, you confess your sin and receive God's forgiveness, does that not result in joy? Amen. Does that not result in happiness? So he says, blessed is the man, watch this though, who is forgiven. This word forgiveness is a picturesque word. Uh, it is the idea of a, of a heavy burden on someone being weighed down. At the point of being crushed by their sin, David's described that. But now he's acknowledged his sin, he's confessed his sin, 
And God's taking that heavy rock that has been crushing him and his knees are buckling. His life is about to be totally ruined. But he acknowledged and confessed his sin and the hand of the grace of God reaches beneath beneath that great burden and lifts that burden off of his life. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Remember that song? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. At Calvary, burdens are lifted. You're carrying around a weight that God didn't design for you to carry. You're carrying around guilt that is not good for your soul. What do you do? You do what the psalmist did. You acknowledge your sin. You confess your sin. And God always lifts that burden of sin from your life. But look what He says in verse verse number 1 again. He said, whose sin is covered. Your sin is not just forgiven. Your sin is forgotten. I've noticed this, that men are not so quick to forget, but God is. You acknowledge your sin, confess your sin, your sin is covered and it is forever forgotten. He says in the very next verse, whose sin is not imputed to them, This is a word of calculation, it is a word of mathematics, it is a word of bookkeeping, Uh, whose sin is not imputed. That is, God does not write that sin to your account. That when you acknowledge and confess your sin, God rubs out that debt and it never ever returns. Forgiven. Covered. What What do those words do for you this morning? In light of the guilt that you're carrying around, in light of the burden of sin that you're carrying around. What do these words, covered and forgiven, mean to you? You know, you can have that today. And the wonderful thing is, you don't have to confess your sin to a man. We confess our sins to the Lord Jesus. And He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ernest Hemingway told the story that a father and son in Madrid, Spain, had a falling out. And the son's name was Paco, which was a very popular name in Madrid. And as a result of the falling out, Paco left his father, ran away from home. The father went to the Madrid newspaper the next morning and took out an ad in the paper and it said, Paco, please come home. All is forgiven. You are loved. Meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper at 8 o'clock in the morning. At 8 o'clock in the morning, the father showed up and there were 800 boys named Paco. We all need forgiveness. Let's stand together. Forgiveness is available. Forgiveness is provided. But dear friend, we have to meet the conditions of God. Would you acknowledge your sin? Confess your sin this morning. God God will forgive. God will forget. If you've never received the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, you can be saved this morning. But you've got to acknowledge your sin and that Jesus is the only one who can save you. And when you call upon His name in faith, He saves and forgives you and makes you His child. Do it. Do it now. Father, use the message now for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.